limits, boundaries, borders. When we're children, they're set for our good. So lost. To protect us, to keep us safe. How did something that was meant for our good and our protection, limits, come to define us? Am I good enough? What about my career? Uh, what did I lead a good life? When did the limits of someday when become the lid that closed so tightly on our already restricted boxes? Did I love my family or not? I'm never going to be good enough. Am I good enough? When did outside voices, opinions, hurts, and disappointments become the borders that limited our dreams? I was more beautiful. When will I be? Thought I knew my path, but... Yet something inside each of us longs for more for life beyond our limits, for possibilities that are waiting, waiting for you to reach out to seize. So the question is, are you willing to take that step? To trust God as we embark on a journey of limitless influence, limitless opportunity, limitless potential, and limitless legacy. As we trust our limitless God, churches planted, leaders developed, communities transformed, care centers expanded, global outposts established, all while leaving a gospel legacy to the next generation. This is Faith Without Borders. All right, I gotta come clean with something. I, I've been holding something in for a long time Kind of like a secret, but many of you got this picture. I want to show you this picture that we sent out to our church. We had it taken in late October, and so this is our family picture. There it is up there. And so this is our Jody and I and our three daughters and our two sons-in-law. And so I want to show you this next picture. My middle daughter, Erin, check it out. She's pregnant. Come on now. She's going to be due in April, and she's having a girl. Isn't that awesome? And so she's the one. She lives out in, um, in Pennsylvania with her husband, Steve. She was a high jumper at Liberty and uh, University, and he was the javelin thrower, and they met. And when your kids go off to college and they go far away, just a little lesson here, they don't come back. Some of us are like, yes. But in all seriousness, I mean, I, so this is what happened back in October. We all find out and everybody says, well, we want to keep it a secret for a while until all other family and everything else. And then everybody looks at me and they're like, dad, you're going to be the first one to crack because you're going to tell the whole church. <laughs> because they know I tell you everything. <laughs> Things I shouldn't be saying, I tell you. But I want the record to show that Ever since October, Jody, we're traveling around. We're going to breakfast places around here and waitresses are coming in. Yes, yeah, my daughter's pregnant. We're with Uber drivers. Oh yeah, my daughter's gonna have a baby. I'm just like, what are you doing? I thought we were supposed to keep this. Well, they don't know us. So I want the record to show that I held out the longest and I didn't tell you until today. So do not come up after and say, oh, you're going to be a grandfather. Oh, it's so good. I'm so excited for you. And I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about it. <laughs> I feel old. And do not say, what are you going to call yourself? What are you, what are you, what are you going to call yourself? I'm a traditionalist, all right? Gramps is fine. <laughs> do not say Pappy Zappy. That's what's been going around. <laughs> Said all that to say this, open up your limitless guides. We got to get serious. Page 22, I've got five secrets that I want to share with you about obedient faith. But these aren't the kind of secrets that I want you to keep to yourself. I want you to feel free. You don't have to hold it in. You can tell anybody at any time, especially those who are pursuing after a growing and vibrant faith, which is what this series is all about. If you're new, uh, joining us online, we're so thankful to have you with us. We're doing this thing, it's called Faith Without Borders. We're walking through the book of Joshua and we're identifying several characteristics of a faith that's growing and a faith that God is blessing. 
And that's the kind of faith we want. That's the kind of faith they had as they possessed the land. We want the same thing. So today's title of the message is Obedient Faith. Craig already prayed for it, that our hearts would be receptive. And so, um, again, if you're new, we're going through this little booklet. Everybody got a booklet? Raise your hand if you don't have a booklet. Okay, sorry, our ushers are ignoring you. I want to apologize on behalf of them. Raise your hand. I'm just joking around, but we'll get your booklet in hand and we'll get one because it's kind of a helpful tool. It's got the message titles. It's got a place for notes. It's got a QR code for you to do additional study. And we've been on this generosity journey, this generosity initiative. And I'm not going to belabor it. I've been spending a couple weeks talking about it. All of it's in the book. So we're on a 24-month, two-year journey. This series serves as the midpoint And what this is, is it's an opportunity. God's doing some stuff. The train has left the station, but this is a stop for everybody to get on so that you can experience all that God desires for you, not only in the life of our church, but most importantly, we want you to grow in generosity for your own well-being, for your own maturity in faith. That's what we're doing. Got it? Good stuff. Okay, let's start on uh, page 22. And let's start on page 22 there. You can just see at the top, I'm going to start reading right there, uh, the scripture in front of us. It says, then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from the place that I don't want to say. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And at the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people. As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, go ahead and underline that. Being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Verse 4, yet there shall be a distance between you and about, and it about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know that the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. So it's a new direction. Verse 5, Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priest, take up the ark and pass on before the people. So they took up the ark and the covenant and they went before the people. And so let's just skip down for a moment. So they're carrying this ark and look at verse 12 all the way down at the end. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priest bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of the earth shall rest on the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut from flowing and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. That's the miracle. Uh, Page 23. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark was dipped in the brink of the water. Verse 16. We'll come back to those details in a moment. The waters coming down from above stood and rose in a heap very far away. You can see at the end of that verse that it's just amazing. And the people, it says at the end of verse 16, passed over opposite Jericho. And then lastly, now the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Father, I pray for you to speak through your word. I pray that you would use me to communicate it in a way that we can apply it to our lives. We can be inspired. Lord, there's a lot of information here, but may it inspire us to take a step of faith. We've got some rivers to cross in our families, in our church. And I just pray your Holy Spirit would just resonate within our hearts to speak to us and to help us. Because Lord, we want a more obedient faith. Give us the secrets to what that is. Use this passage to do so. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. So five secrets. If you're a note taker, you can go ahead and write down the first sequence. secret. Excuse me. Faith requires obedience. So I wish there was some other way to describe this, but faith always requires obedience. Um, Eugene Peterson called it a long obedience in the same direction. It's obedience is doing what God wants, when God wants it done, with a God-honoring smile. That's obedience. It's stepping forward, not stepping back forward. Doing what God wants, when he wants, and doing it with a way that is pleasing to him. So that's obedience. Let me paint 
the picture if you're just new joining us, especially those online, and maybe you're not sure exactly what are we doing. Well, we're walking through the book of Joshua, and last week we found out that the people of God, they're possessing the promised land. They had wandered for 40 years, remember? And, and what happened is that what should have took three or four months took 40 years, and now they're up in Jericho, we looked at that last week in Joshua chapter two, and they gotta get through that city. God did some unique things, we'll get back to that, we'll see that in a moment, but there's a river in front of them. And this river they have to cross, this is the river of Jordan. This is, some commentators tell us, two to three million people that are gonna cross this river. We'll talk about the details, but imagine you standing at the brink of the biggest river you've ever seen, not some little creek. And that was what lied in front of them, that that was the challenge, the difficulty for them to enter what God wanted. There's always a challenge. There's always a barrier. There's always a difficulty. If you want to pursue hard after God, can I get an amen? There's always some difficulty that's going to come to prevent you and make you desire to step back and say, I don't think I can do it. That's the best place to be because you can't. And so these people couldn't cross this river. So this is where the how comes in. How'd they do it? Well, take a look with me at verse three and four, and this is the key. I asked you to underline it. It's the Ark of the Covenant. And so this is very important. So the Ark in the Old Testament, this is what housed. It's this box. It's four and a half by two and a half by two and a half. It's gold-plated. I mean, it's this box that contains manna. It's a jar of manna to remind them of how God had provided for them in the wilderness. If we remember in the Old Testament, it says that it came down from heaven and that's what the people ate. It has uh, Aaron's rod in it. And Aaron's rod, he was the priest and it shows the priestly functions that he had. It's, it's got the 10 commandments in it, the two tablets that Moses gave. And so it has the commandments, it got the law. And, and then on the top of it, there's what they call a mercy seat. And this mercy seat is this, this is where the priests would shed the blood. There's two cherubims that face each other. And, and this is where the presence, this God dwelt on the mercy seat. And, and so that's where they would make the sacrifice. Anybody seen the first movie, Indiana Jones? Now do you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember that arc? Like, I don't know about all that other stuff. But I mean, that was a pretty interesting thing. And, and so in all seriousness, what was the ark to them? Got to get this. If you don't get this, you won't get anything I'm about to say. The ark was a picture. It was the presence of God. It was the literal presence of the Lord. That was the ark. That was why it was so significant. That's why it was so important. That's why it had to lead the way. That's why they said, hey, stay away from it. 2,000 cubits. That's 1,000 feet. So there was some priests who had it on poles, and they couldn't touch it. There's a bad story that happened if you did touch it, if you know the Old Testament, that, oh, we're not going to talk about that. But we don't want to touch it because we're unholy and, and we're unrighteous. And, and, and that represents God. And we can't stand before a holy God because of our sin, because of our lack of faith. But we want a courageous faith, don't we? We want an obedient faith. That's what we're talking about. All these characteristics, each message title is a characteristic of faith that we desire. Seven characteristics of the faith that we're going after at High Point Church. Oh, boy. I get so passionate and they're just, Lord, can you help them at least say something, Lord? Please, Lord. Lord, I'm begging you, Lord, please do something. No, that's not it right there. Thanks for carrying the whole place. Can you drive over to Wheaton with me in about a half an hour? Okay, so seriously though, this is the presence of the Lord and that's what we're going after. We want our faith to be obedient. So, so this is God's presence. It paves the way. They, they have to stay a thousand yards behind it. I don't know, um, you know, Craig always talks about, he's a runner, Craig is. I don't know if you know that. He ran like 10,000 miles in two days. I'm just kidding. It was like how many years? 10 years? It was less than 10, right? Come on, just, just brag a little. 10 years. It was less than 10. He doesn't want to brag. 
But like, I mean, that's a, that takes a lot of commitment. I remember when I, um, we have a lot in common because I, I have a lot of, I like to run. I don't run, I'm not crazy. <laughs> But when I was, um, I turned late 30s, and it was like 40, and I had this epiphany. I was just like, man, I'm, I've been an athlete my whole life, and I, I don't know, what am I going to do? And I, I can't beat up on those guys on the basketball floor anymore. i got to do something. And so I started doing triathlons. And so triathlons are, uh, for those who know it, anybody, any triathlon people in, in the house? So it's, it's what? It's swimming, it's biking, and then it's running. And so I, I trained for this. There was a girl in our church. She was from Michigan. She's unbelievable. She was like winning these things. And so she helped me train. And so what I did was is that I identified, you know, swimming I wasn't too good at, biking I was okay. And, and so she told me when, when you're biking, and, and you guys who do this, you'll know this, that, that there's this thing called drafting. And so what you want to do is you want to get yourself close enough in this pocket of air where it's less resistance and, and so, you know, so that it pulls you. And then you, you don't use as much energy. And it's almost like you catapult in there. And so I'm like, man, I got to get in this. I got to get in this thing. And I'm getting too close. I'm not too far. And, and then what I realized, I'm the biggest guy out there in the Clydesdale division. <laughs> Everyone's trying to draft off me because there's no wind. And so, like, you know, I'm just like, what? I'm trying to draft off you. Like, what's happening here? And so set all that to simply say this. That's what they were doing with the ark. They were drafting off of it. Like they couldn't do it. I'm not saying it's so important when we're talking about obedient faith that it doesn't not require anything from you. It requires something. It's gonna be strenuous. It's gonna be hard. It's gonna feel like 10,000 miles in 10 years sometimes. It isn't easy, but God, takes away and the miraculous he gives you energy he gives you strength do you know what i'm talking about and he he pulls you through that's the picture of obedience that's faith requires obedience and obedience requires second secret it requires surrender so you got to give yourself to this can I just praise the Lord for 14 people last weekend at all of our locations. We shared the gospel and they want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. And so that's what we're about. New to the church. Hey, what's this all about? This is about Jesus. We love Jesus. Didn't always love Jesus. Realize what Jesus did is he paved the way for me to have a relationship with God. We had 14 people who came to that recognition and realization, and praise the Lord, they surrendered. And so that's an important part of obedience. It requires full surrender. It requires total surrender. Jody and I visited her mom. We did, um, I don't know, maybe 800 miles in, in 24 hours. And some of you know that uh, some, I look in your faces, and I know you've had parents that are they're aging, and it's difficult. And so Jody's mom is, is not doing great. Um, she suffers from dementia, and she's in Toledo. And so we got the call. We're just like, I don't know. And, and so we left yesterday, and we drove through the crazy storm um, on Thursday night or whatever it was. Uh, I don't know when it was. Yeah, when did we leave? No, we left last night, Friday. Friday. Yeah, we left Friday and went through this crazy storm. And, and then we got there, and we just spent a little bit of time with her. And, and it was just so cool to open up God's word. And you know, she doesn't, she responds to God's word. It, I mean, I don't know how for how long. I, I don't know what. But I can remember when she totally surrendered her life in her 60s. She got baptized at 69. Praise the Lord for surrender. And she's been obeying him. And, and so pray. We're just praying. Sometimes you just pray, Lord, you... It's been 90, she had, she, her birthday's Monday. It's going to be 91 years. Wow. And so we're just praying for the Lord to, to, you know, she knows where she's headed. And so obedience requires surrender. Have you surrendered? Did they surrender? I want to give you some steps to surrendering so you can be like Jody's mom and do a full term 91 years. <laughs> what do I mean? Well, the first step is this. We see them right in the text. We're a Bible church, so we're going to look right in the text is that I surrender when I consecrate myself to God. 
And, and that's what we've got to do is consecrate. It's this term that's here. It's literally used, um, we see it 172 times in the Old Testament. One of the most familiar ones was when Moses came off the mountaintop with the Ten Commandments and he comes to the people and the first thing he says to them is consecrate yourselves. It literally means to make yourself holy. Now we can't do it in and of ourselves. We need Christ. We need God. We need his word. We need his spirit. And so we want to consecrate ourselves to surrender ourselves to the Lord that he would work through us. Secondly, we see, and that's what uh, Joshua asks. Secondly, we see in the text, verse 6, and Joshua, I surrender when I let God lead. And that's the picture here. Is so they took up the Ark of the Covenant, the priests did, because Joshua told them, and they went before the people. So they're carrying this thing, and they're going before the people. And so the people are willing to follow God. And, and so he's going to do something. And so we got to be willing to follow God. And for us, we got to follow his word. And we're living in a day. Anybody agree with me when this is not accepted and this is looked down upon and the culture is dictating a lot of things that we would disagree with? Speaking truth. And so we got to follow God. And so if we're going to surrender, we need to consecrate ourselves through the blood of Christ. They were doing it through the blood of animals at the mercy seat. We've got to let God lead. And where, God, where is God taking you? Precursor to the end. What, what, where's, what step of faith is God asking you to take? I'm asking the Holy Spirit right now. Holy Spirit, deposit. Get to the people. Everyone I can't always understand this. God can be here with all of us. He can be here with the whole world and he can speak to each one of us all at the same time. And that he would speak to you today. Where is he leading as you surrender? And then third step right here in the Old Testament. I depend on the Lord. So the Lord said to Joshua and L-O-D, L-O-R-D is really important when we double click on that. That's Yahweh. That's the most intimate name for God. That's, you know, the Israelites wouldn't even say it out loud. That's how intimate it was. And so that is God's first name. It's like that indicates the intimate relationship that he has with us. He had with Joshua. And he says, today I'm going to exalt you in the sight of Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, I I'm with you. The New Testament tells us in James to humble ourselves and we will be exalted. You ain't going to be exalted because of who you are, but who Christ is. You're not going to be exalted for your name, but for Christ's name. You're not going to be exalted for your fame, our fame, his fame. That's why he exalts the humble. And so here we see it. I'm going to be with you. So we got to depend on the Lord. New Testament example, it's John 15. It's apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. It's abiding, write that word in your notes. Abide, to abide means to make your home in. That's dependence on Christ so that I can get through the challenge that I can draft off him, that he will part the sea. And then we see, again, in the text, we see I surrender when I do what? When next one is I wait on the Lord. And I, I've got to wait on him. And, and that's what, the priests were commanded. They had the Ark of the Covenant. Can you imagine? And, and they're right there at the edge, and, and they got to, you shall stand still in the Jordan. So the priests had to lead the way, and, and, and so they're standing right in the midst. Their feet are getting wet. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But they waited. They had to wait. Anybody feel like you're waiting on God for something? Maybe it's the restoration of a relationship. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a boss that's going to treat you like you ought to be treated, not so unfair to you. I don't know what you're waiting on him for. Maybe to open up the heart of your neighbor that you could insert the gospel at their point of need. I, I don't, who's waiting? I, we're waiting. The Christian life is all about waiting. And so we, we surrender when, when we wait on the Lord. Now know your personality. For me, I, I haven't always waited, and I like to not just peek in the door that God opens, I like to bust it down. I like to sometimes jar the lock door and get in. That's my personality, so waiting for me is two steps. For some, 
You say, yeah, you're right, you shouldn't do that. And then my question for you is, are you the person that's waiting, 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 and you never take the step of faith? And you're just passively waiting, and yeah, you're not aggressive, and that's awesome, but please know yourself. Are you the person that busts through, take two steps back? Are you the person that never walks through? This is not about forever. This is not forever. They, they, can you see the, 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 the little thing that God does that he breaks through, that he wants you to step in? I mean, you gotta ask for, God, give me the eyes to see what you see, that I could recognize the little step that I need to take. Andrew Murray, we'll go to him. He's the spiritual guru here. And he says this about waiting. He says, waiting is to teach us our absolute dependence upon God's mighty working and to make us in perfect patience place ourselves at his disposal. They that wait on the Lord shall inherit the land. There it is. They, they, the promised land and all of its blessing. The heirs must wait. They can afford to wait. So, 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 so these are how I know if I fully surrender. And, and that's required. That's important and so if faith requires obedience and obedience requires surrender then the next secret is surrender surrender requires submission and so here's a great thing to talk about in our day submission let's just understand what the bible teaches the bible teaches we're to submit to three three things First and foremost, James chapter four, verse seven says we're to submit to God. He's the one. Ephesians chapter five, verse 21 says we're to submit to each other. Not enough of that going on in the church. Submitting to each other. Goes on in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 to say that we should submit to spiritual authority. Now, now just hold your thought on that and let's just stop for a moment. Submitting is a military term in the um, New Testament, and, and what it means is that what? That I'm going to willingly place myself under someone's authority. I'll never forget when I heard somebody say a long time ago when I first came a Christian, and this person that was teaching us, and disciple, and Jody and I, and, and he said, if you, if you won't you submit yourself to man, you'll never submit to God. If you refuse to put yourself under someone else, you'll never know what it means to submit to God. And I had to, uh, whoa. So who have you submitted to? In relationships, husband and wife submitting to each other. In your job, submitting to your boss, putting yourself under. In, in, in athletics, a coach, I gotta, I gotta have a team, I gotta have my players, they gotta put themselves under, they gotta submit to the coach. And, and so submission is part of life. It's I submit to God, I submit to others, I submit to the spiritual leaders. Now, just stop for a moment because not a lot of that going on. Because sometimes there's some unhealthy ways, and I've stood at the front of this church right here in this exact spot and, and cried with someone who, more than once, who was under ungodly submission, and they were under unbiblical and like cultish. I, I, I've seen it and, and prayed with that person over the years. and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about healthy, biblical and we do here, you know, I've been doing this now for 22 years in the same place. Amen. 22, I mean, I, I've seen some patterns. There's what we pastors, when we talk, we talk about the seven-year itch. And the seven-year itch is about you people. And as soon as seven years comes in, there's just something that happens. And we get to know you a little bit too well. You get to know us. And you know what, I don't know if I want to be pressed in right there. So I'm going to go over to church XYZ down the street and, and I must spend seven years over there. And then, oh, well, you know what, they're getting to know me a little bit and that's getting a little too hot and I'm going to go over to church ABC. I've been doing this long enough where I see the people come back. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, we're, I, I'm joking around to just say sometimes if we fail to put ourselves in meaningful relationships where we invest in each other, then you're not really known and you can walk a dance. And I just think there's, there's a lot of movement in the church without a lot of commitment. Am I speaking truth? 
And, and so just, you know, you just, I'm not saying you never can leave. I ain't saying that. I mean, I'm looking at a guy in the front row here. I remember when you came here and helped us get into this building and the Lord called you to Texas and, and now you're back. What are you doing back? <laughs> but in all, in all seriousness, the Lord moves and, and thankful that like, like, like we want to know each other so that we can grow and and so this submission, it's about what? Putting ourselves under so that we can grow together in the Lord. And so, so that's what we want to see. And so why should we do it? Well, because they did it. So who did it in the text? Let's look at the text. Let's let the Old Testament drive us. Well, Joshua submitted to God. I would say he submitted to the others too. And, and we see that for sure. Joshua said to the people, come here and listen to the words of the Lord. He put himself under God. Who else submitted? Well, in this story, the leaders of the 12 tribes submitted. And, and what they did is now therefore take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe, and they did exactly what Joshua said. And then, and then what? Who else? Well, I, I, the priests submitted. They're the ones, man, they probably had the hardest job. They had to go put their soles of their feet in the water and, and trust that God was going to move. And then who else submitted? Well, everybody did. Look, the people submitted. And so when the people of God submitted of their tents to pass over the Jordan, my, my point is that everyone was submitting together and following after the Lord, and then the Lord does the miracle. And, and it's beautiful. And, and so who do you need to put yourself under so, so that God's going to do some miracles so that you can follow after his word, so, so you can stop trying to do this Christian life on your own and, and that you can connect in a meaningful way. That, that's it. And, and so that's the picture. Surrender requires submission. And then you know where this is going. You see kind of the bouncing ball effect? So now I got something to say about submission. Submission, the next secret is, it requires action. And, and so, so there's an action that, that needs to take place. And, and this is where, man, I, this is like my favorite part because... Look at verses 15 and 16. This is where we've, we've described it, but let me tell you, the, the feet of the priests had to go in, and, and so they felt the water. And so if we, if we look at the text, Bible church, want to look at the text, I skipped over this. Now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the time of harvest. Do you want to know what time of year this was? It was harvest. So the reason that's in there, God's into the details, that what? That this is where the river was at its highest. And so, you know, maybe you've seen a river or lived by one where it's just like, man, that thing is overflowing. That's the picture. Some would say that it was, could have been up to a mile wide and 17 feet deep. Imagine white water. It was 1,000 gallons per minute. I mean, sometimes what God's asking us to cross, the river and the difficulty, and he's leading us with his presence and the ark, and you're like, I can't do it. You're right. It's too deep. And, and they had to put their feet in. They were the first. I, I, just, I just love that picture. And so it was a huge step of faith. And so if I slow down for a moment, steps of faith, what steps of faith have I taken? Well, I remember when um, I quit my job and I went back to school at 30 and I didn't think I could do it. And my dad told me, echoing in my ear, that don't ever quit your job without another job. Anyone have a dad like that? Yes, and, and I'm just saying, like, like, like I didn't, that was, I, I, he had to help us. I remember when Jody and I, when we got into ministry, and, and um, you know, as soon as what happens is she gets pregnant, like, what the, that, we weren't planning on that. And, and then we didn't have, I didn't have a full-time gig, and I didn't have health care. And, and I remember, like, we stepped out and God provided. There's just so many examples. I mean, sitting on this stage, I mean, getting into this facility, like, it's a huge step of faith. Some of you were here. And, and God did some amazing things that we, we could be in this place. And, and so I, I've seen God move. Where, where have you stepped out? I wonder how many people, if you just thought about it for a moment, you, you took that step of faith and God blessed it. And he, he parted the waters. It, anybody ever been in that place? And, and, and so you can't, you can't describe the feeling. It, 
it's such a big, your feet are getting wet. And I love this picture because it shows that the leaders go first. And so we've always, I've always taught this principle and I've modeled it that, that I would never ask you to do something that, that I wouldn't do myself. And so all these things, we're taking steps of faith in pages four and five to expand God's kingdom. And so you could turn to page four and five. You don't have to do it now, but that, we're, those are steps of faith. Hey, hey, we're taking a step of faith. The river is flowing. We're asking God to part it. Stepping out in faith by planting a church in a prison. Come on, man. And God's, God's rewarding it. We're taking steps of faith. And so I... I think sometimes you, you may not realize it, but the reason I tell you about the steps of faith I took and the steps of faith we're taking is because I just want you to take one. And I don't know what it is. But I'm just trying to say, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't turn back. And once you do it, it God blesses it. And so, Holy Spirit, what's the step of faith that each of us needs to take? Maybe it's about a relationship. Maybe it's about a job. Maybe it's about getting involved more in church. Maybe it's about, maybe it's about going to that prison and helping minister to the men. What is it? Maybe it's about getting involved here with our students or at our care center. Or, like, what's the step of faith? Maybe it's about, well, this generosity initiative. Oh, really? Maybe it's about a greater level of generosity that, that you don't see it and you haven't done it. And may I suggest that that may be one of the hindrances to your growth with your time, your talents, your treasure, your testimony. Man, I'm just saying I've taken steps of faith and God's parted some sea. And I don't think if we talked to any of these people, they'd be like, I wish we wouldn't have done it. I mean, those priests, we were thankful to be the first ones, man. Hey, let me just describe to you what it felt like to have the river flowing under my toes. I mean, that's what they're going to be saying in heaven. We were the first. Joshua 3 and 4, that was me. Come over and sit at my feet. Look at the foot that was grazed in the water. I, I mean, you know, I'm kidding around, but I'm just saying it. Nobody, when you do it and you see the miracle and you experience it, hey, hey submission, it, it requires action. And, and that's what we see. And so lastly, fifth secret, uh, action results in blessing. And so I've just tried to describe that. I'm going to invite our worship uh, team up, thankful for them to be here today. And, and so, so I want us to think about this, and I want us to, we're moving, we're rounding third, and like, we're, we're, we're running home, and we're going to slide in, and, and, and you got to, for you to score in this message, it's like you, you got to think about what's God calling you to do. And, and, and so I just, I just want to paint a picture of, of this wall of water that looked impossible to cross. And, and so, so action results in blessing. And, and look what happened at the end. I, like you could see it. I just want to put it in yellow. It says, all of Israel passed over on dry ground. So God's so into the details. So, so catch it. I mean, there was a river. It was a mile wide. It could have been 17 feet deep. So it's like this. And, and it parts. And then isn't God so cool? It, whoa, it's not soggy. What, what happened? It, it's not wet. I, I'm not getting any of my sandals. I don't have to go in the grass and clean my sandals off because it's so dry. Is God not into the details? And they just walk through. And whoa, I mean, I don't know. I, if it was me, I'd be sticking my finger in there, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd keep a thousand yards away from the ark, but I'd be messing with this. <laughs> Come on, Zappy, get over here. I, I mean, honestly, somebody said I'm running through. <laughs> but, but isn't it true that, that they experienced the miraculous? And so I just want to point out a, a couple details, you know, because they're following the ark. Remember we talked about that? We're not following the ark. We're following the presence. But we're following the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, who God's revealed to us his son, his one and only son. And his presence makes it possible for us to consecrate ourselves to God. And so let me just give me some liberty here. But as I've thought about this, 
I look at the manna that was in the ark, and isn't it true that Jesus said, I am the bread of life? He's our manna. He's the one that feeds us. And, 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 and just, I mean, follow me for a moment. It, it, it had the staff, and Aaron's staff, and Aaron was the priest. There was many priests. And Jesus is our high priest. He's the only one we need. No more needed. And, and then what else? It's like we've got, we got the Ten Commandments. And isn't it true that Jesus is the only one that kept them all? And Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. So as I look at this ark, it's the presence of God. It's the presence for them. It's the presence for us fulfilled in Jesus. As I think about the mercy seat and the blood sacrifices that needed to take place for the people to be holy and righteous. Hebrews tells us that there's only one sacrifice. Can we praise God? There's only one sacrifice. That one sacrifice, it's done. Nothing else. No more needed. It provides us with a relationship with him. And then I don't want to push the text too far, but, but the mercy seat had these two cherubim facing each other. And I just, in my mind, I just think about the empty grave. And I think about the two angels at the head of where Jesus had laid and at his feet where he had laid. And those two cherubim are announcing the news and the two angels announce it to us. And so I, I don't know. I think this is a picture of the risen Christ and who he wants to, what he wants to do and what he has accomplished and, and that he's going to be the one to get us through these things so that we don't get all wet, so that our feet go on dry ground. And so we push forward. And so I'm just going to ask you to stand. And now is called the response time if you're here. Um, if you're at home, you can respond in your seat. I'm just going to ask that you'd some of you may kneel down. Some of you may come forward to the front. We're going to open the front. And so, I, you know, I don't know, maybe one person, two people, 20 people, whatever. But, but I think there's some rivers that God's calling us to cross. And, and I believe that, you know, why come up front and pray? Well, the, I can tell you there's so many times when Jody and I were right where you are, and there was a decision that we had and that there was a thing that we were wrestling with, and sometimes it was really painful, and just to put the stake in the ground and to call out that the Lord, and for somebody to lay their hand on my, on my shoulder and just pray a prayer, and even sometimes it's like, whoa, how did they know that? And, and that you're just you're placing your trust and your confidence and you're dependent upon him. Not gonna beg anybody to respond, but there's just something about the stake in the ground moment. Praise the Lord for our brother that you just... There's a river to cross. So what rivers we've got to cross? The worship team's going to lead us. So let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Maybe it's a river of past hurt and shame. And, and maybe it's about something somebody did to you. Listen, that wasn't right. We live in a stain, sin-stained world. And, and that, that, it's unrighteous. And, and, and you didn't do anything wrong. And, and, and there's hurt and there's shame that, 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 that you just got to let it go. God wants to part the way. Maybe, maybe it's a, a relational difficulty. And maybe there's someone you need to forgive. Believe me, I know the pain of forgiving the family members. Oh, Lord, how could she do that? How could he? The relational difficulty where God's going to part the way. Come forward and pray. Maybe it's a financial turmoil and we're talking about a generosity initiative and you're saying, man, I need a job. But let God part the river. And maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's a river of career change that, man, I've been moving in this one direction and I sense God saying this and when you said you went back and got your education, I need to finish what I started. Like, remember, obedience, you, you step forward and it's gonna take work. But God parts the sea and just... Respond as you feel led. We've been spending the first seven weeks of this year on freedom from addictive behaviors. Maybe there's, there's a river of a habit that, that you need to place down. And lastly, I didn't say it, but the Holy Spirit did. Let's respond as you feel led. I'll ask the leaders of the church even to come and dip your feet in for the rest of the church that you would respond and call out by faith. Let's pray over people. Praise the Lord. Let's worship him.